when two forces F1 and F2 acting on a point, uh, if F1 and F2 act in the same direction, uh, the maximum resultant has a magnitude of 13 newtons. Uh, what are we saying? We're essentially saying that uh, F1 plus F2 is equals to uh, 13 newtons, right? And then the equation uh, goes on to say that uh, if F1 and F2 act in the opposite directions, uh, the magnitude of the minimum resultant is 3 newton, right? Uh, so let's say, for instance, F2 is greater than F1, uh, then we're going to have something like uh, F2 minus F1 uh, being equals to uh, 3 newtons. Uh, that's what essentially uh, we get in from the statement. And then uh, the question now says that uh, the magnitude of the two forces in newton is, right? So right now we know that uh, our first criteria, F1 plus F2 should be equals to uh, 13 newtons. So let's go and look for two forces uh, that can give us that before we look at the second option. So obviously here, if you look at A, we have 8 and 5, right? And we know fully well that 8 plus 5 is equals to 13 newtons. So A uh, satisfy our first condition and then B 16 and 10 uh, that cannot be true. And then for C, we have 3 and 10, which is also equals to 13, right? And then D, we have 10 and 7, which is definitely not true. So now we're just looking at A and C uh, to find our answer, right? So let's look at our second criteria. We need F2 minus F1 to be equals to 13 newtons. So you can see for option A, uh, if you say 8 uh, minus 5, you're going to get uh, 3 newtons. And then if you say 5 minus 8, you're going to get uh, minus 3 newtons, right? We are only interested in the magnitude. So 8 and 5 clearly works. So our answer for 1.1 1 .1, uh, is going to be A. But let's also look at C and see if we can uh, satisfy our equation. Uh, so for C, we have uh, 3 and 10, right? Uh, clearly, 10 minus 3 is equals to uh, 7 newtons and 3 minus 10 will be equals to uh, minus 7. So only A satisfy our conditions. Now we can look at 1.2. 1 uh, 1.2 says that a free moving block slides down an inclined plane at a constant velocity. This means that then before I even look at my uh, options, with my eyes closed, I know fully well that if we are moving at constant velocity, right? So what is the uh, consequence of constant velocity? Uh, the consequence of constant velocity is that acceleration is zero, right? But then what is the consequence of an acceleration being equals to zero? Uh, F net is equals to ma. So if acceleration is equal to zero, then F net is equal to zero, right? Now I can look at my options, right? A says that uh, the frictional force acting on the block is zero, right? There's no way we can tell with the information we have. That can be true, that cannot be true. We're not sure, right? And then for B, it says that uh, the net force acting on the block is in the direction down the slope of the plane. Uh, the net force acting on the block is in the direction if f net is equal to zero we cannot really talk about the direction of that net force and then for c it says that uh, the net force acting on the block is zero and then uh, like we have already stated if the acceleration is zero the f net is going to be zero so our answer for 1.2 is going to be um, option c now let's look at 1.3. Uh, 1.3 says that a trolley is pushed along a horizontal surface with a force of 150 newtons at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal. The trolley experiences a constant frictional force of 60 newtons. And then our diagram uh, clearly demonstrates that. And then we have few options there, uh, one, two, three, right? Before the multiple choice itself. Uh, so they're saying that, uh, the net force acting on the trolley causes the trolley to accelerate horizontally, right? Along the x axis. Uh, that is, that is true. Uh, let me show you why I'm saying it's true. Uh, we know that 
uh, f net will be equal to force applied along the x plus uh, the frictional force right uh, that's in the horizontal so f applied along the x that will be 150 multiplied by cos of 45 and then minus 60 degrees or oh, not 60 degrees but uh, 60 newtons uh, from the frictional force so what is 150 multiplied by cos of 45 uh, that is 106.06 uh, minus 60 right uh, so clearly uh, f net here is uh, not zero is greater than zero so we're going to be accelerating um, along the horizontal right so our first option i uh, is correct right let's look at uh, the second option so we're saying that this option is correct uh, the second option is saying that the net force is equal to uh, the applied force uh, that is not true right uh, the net force is going to be 1 of 6 minus 6 uh, which is going to be uh, 46 point uh, zero six uh, somewhere there right so our second uh, point is not true let's look at the third one uh, so we say in this here it's not true uh, the net force acting on the trolley is horizontally forward that is that is true right uh, because uh, it's positive uh, we're moving in in the right direction so here our options um, so we say in the first one and the third one are true right and that seems to be option C right so for 1.3 uh, we are going with uh, option C so that's our answer for 1.3 now let's go to 1.4 so 1.4 here is saying that a man in lift is moving upwards at a constant speed the weight of the um, uh, man is w according uh, to newton's third law the reaction force of the weight is the force of so what you have to think of now is why do we even experience weight right uh, we just know that uh, there's an equation uh, w is equals to m multiplied by g but then do you ever think about where this equation is coming from uh, because we know for the world that if we're looking for g the acceleration right that will be uh, the capital letter g uh, and then the mass uh, divided by r squared right so if we substitute that into w you'll realize that we have g uh, mass one mass two divided by r squared right so this is uh, the force between two bodies attracting each other so we experience the weight because we are also exacting a force on the earth right so uh, the reaction force of weight is the force of the man on the earth and the reaction force of the man on the earth is the weight right so our answer for 1.4 will therefore uh, be option D, right? Uh, the reaction force of the weight is the man on the earth. The reaction force of the man on the earth is uh, the weight, right? And then let's do 1.6. 1.6 is saying, 1.5, I meant. So 1.5 is saying uh, the optical density of a medium um, and then dot, 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 so before we go any further let's talk about uh, the word optical density so what are we talking about we're talking about optical uh, density right so optical density is directly proportional to refractive index right uh, the higher uh, the optical density of an of a medium uh, the higher the refractive index of that medium so let's look at our option here uh, the optical density of a medium will be high if the refraction of light is less right uh, that is clearly not true because we're seeing that the optical density is directly proportional uh, to the refractive index of a medium so a is incorrect now let's look at b b is saying that uh, the optical density of a medium is a measure of the refractive power of the medium right and that's exactly what i've been proposing so for 1.5 
uh, we go in with option B. Uh, the optical density of a medium is a measure of the refractive power of that medium, right? And as a consequence, the higher the optical density, the higher the refractive index of that medium. And let's do 1.6. 1.6 says that uh, in which one of the following graphs below will the gradient represent the refractive index of a material when light passes from air through the material? So obviously, I'm not going to guess, right? Uh, we have graphs, so we need an equation, right? Uh, so we have light passing from one medium to another. So like we always do in this situation, we're going to need uh, Snell's law. So what are we saying? Uh, we're saying that uh, we're going from A uh, to some uh, medium, right? To some material that uh, we don't really know. So if we use Snell's law, we're going to get uh, Ni sine uh, theta i being equals to Nr sine uh, theta r. So we're going from A to some medium. Uh, we know fully well that uh, the refractive index of A is 1. So if we substitute that, we're going to get 1 multiplied by sine of uh, theta i being equals to nr sine of theta r. Anything multiplied by 1 is just that thing, right? So we're going to get uh, sine theta i being equals to nr sine of theta r, right? And then you should be able to see here that uh, we have y uh, is equals to m, and then uh, this becomes our x plus c, but then in this situation, uh, c is zero, right? Uh, so the gradient here is going to be uh, the refractive index of the material, right? And then sine theta i is going to be on the y-axis and sine theta r is going to be on the x-axis, right? And then if you look at our graphs here, uh, that is option uh, D. Uh, so 1.7 is saying that every point on a wave front acts as a point source of spherical secondary waves that move forward at the same speed as the wave. Uh, this statement uh, represents, and then we have uh, Snell's law, uh, that is not Snell's law, obviously. And then for B, we have uh, Huygens principle, right? And that's definitely uh, what the definition says. So our answer for 1.7 uh, is B. Uh, just look up, uh, you know, uh, the definition and the principle accompany it and uh, you will realize that the answer for 1.7 is B. And then uh, for 1.8, uh, this is an interesting one, right? It's really easy, but yeah, it's interesting. Uh, saying that uh, three charges of magnitude plus 2Q uh, plus 2q and minus 2q are shown in the sketch below, right? Uh, which arrow currently represents the direction of the net force acting on the minus 2q charge? So let's pay our attention to the minus 2q charge, right? So here it is. Uh, clearly it is negative, right? And then here we have plus 2q. So how does the positive charge interact with the negative charge. They attract each other, right? So the plus 2q charge will be uh, pulling the minus 2q charge upwards, right? And then here we have minus 2q and plus 2q. So this one will be pulling it to the right because they are attracting each other, right? So you should see now that uh, the resultant uh, net force, right, uh, will be somewhere there, right? And then which option is that? Uh, that is option A, right? And then now we can move forward and go to uh, where we're we going. We can move forward and go to uh, 1.9. So we have 1.9. Uh, 1.9 is saying which one of the sketches below represents the correct magnetic field pattern around a straight current carrying conductor, right? So you should see that uh, you probably haven't seen anything like C before, and that is not true, and D is also not true, right? Uh, the answer for 1.9 is actually B.
right? Uh, why am I saying the answer for 1.9? It's B. We're using a hand rule. And because of the format of the video, uh, there's no way I can show you that, right? Uh, but then in the description of the video, I uh, will put a link uh, to a resource that can uh, help you understand this concept better. And uh, 1.10, 1.10 says, uh, which of the following graphs uh, below correctly represents the relationship between potential difference and current in a non-ohmic resistor? So if the question was saying in an ohmic resistor, then the answer would be A, obviously, right? And then um, B, uh, B, there's no way the voltage can be uh, increasing and the current is going down, right? C looks like an ohmic resistor, uh, but then you can see that uh, instead of being a straight line, it's uh, sort of, you know, uh, it's exponential, right? And then that's exactly uh, what the graph of a non-ohmic resistor looks like. So our answer here for 1.10 is going to be C. So we have two forces that are acting at a point on a Cartesian plane, right? Uh, we have the 80 Newton force acting to the right and the 50 Newton force acting at an angle. And then 2.1 says give a term for the following description, which says a single vector having the same effect as two or more vectors. We know fully well that that's a resultant vector, right? So you just write that and you get your one mark. And then we have 2.2 and 2.2.1. That says calculate the magnitude of the vertical component of the 50 Newton force. So we know fully well at this point that if we want to calculate the vertical component, which I'm denoting by the arrow, right? We take the force and multiply it by sine of the angle. And if the question was asking us to calculate the horizontal component, which I'm denoting again by the arrow, we will we'll take the force and multiply it by cos of the angle. So if we go ahead and do that, we're going to have f of y uh, being the vertical component is equal to the force multiplied by sine of the angle, like I'm saying, right? So we're going to have 50 Newton multiplied by sine of 30 degrees. And then if you put that in your calculator, you're going to get 25 Newton. And then moving ahead to 2.2.2, .2, it says calculate the magnitude of the resultant force, right? So we know fully well that the resultant force squared is equal to the x component of the resultant force squared plus the y component of the resultant force squared. So let's go and look at the x components of uh, the resultant force, right? So if we look at this, uh, you will realize that we have the 80 Newton force that is pushing to the right. And then we have uh, this component here, which we have in that term mind, which is uh, pulling to the left. And then on our vertical axis, we only have uh, the vertical component of the 15 Newton force. So up to so far, we can see that the resultant force uh, squared is equal to R of X plus 25 Newton squared, right? Now the question becomes, what is R of X, right? That's what you basically are supposed to conclude. So R of X will be equals to the 80 newton force minus the x component of the 50 newton force right which will be f multiplied by cos of 30. so if we go ahead and do that we're gonna get r of x is equals to 80 minus 50 
multiply by cos of 30 which will give you 36.7 newton so now in place of r of x we can put 36.7 newton so we're gonna have r squared is equals to 36.7 a newton squared plus 25 squared so we're gonna have r being equals to the square root of the two right 36 Point seven plus 25 squared which is equals to 44.441 newton and then you get your five marks and then for 2.2.3 it says calculate the direction of the resultant net force so when we calculate direction there's two ways of doing it let me show you what I'm talking about. So we have already said that we have a vertical component, right? And then we have a horizontal component and then we have our resultant. So for you to calculate the direction of the resultant force, you calculate it from either the vertical axis, the Y axis or the X axis. So you can calculate this angle here uh, as your direction. Or you can calculate this angle here as your direction right so in the name of um, the angle of inclination in math we're gonna calculate from the x-axis to the resultant force right because that's what we do when we want to calculate uh, the angle of inclination in math so I just want us to use something that we're gonna always use so on your answer book you're gonna put this catch here and you're gonna show that I'm actually calculating this angle here between uh, the x-axis and the resultant force. So if you want to uh, calculate that angle, you will use tan of theta equals to opposite divided by adjacent, right? So what is the adjacent? The adjacent is the x component. So it's 36 uh, point 0.7 right and then the opposite is the y which you can put here of 25 newton right so you're gonna say um tan theta is equals to the opposite which is 25 divided by the adjacent which is 36.7 so you're gonna have theta equals to tan arc of 25 divided by 36 point seven uh, being equals to 34.26 degrees if you want to ask any questions or anything is not clear or you have a video request please just leave it in the comment and as soon as i see it i will respond accordingly a box with a mass of 45 kg is pulled with a force of 90 newton at an angle of 50 degrees to the horizontal the box moves at a constant velocity and then 3.1 says define the term kinetic frictional force we know fully well that that's the force that opposes the motion of a moving object relative to a surface the force that opposes the motion of a moving object relative to a surface and then 3.2 says state newton's first law of motion in words it states that a body will remain in its state of rest or motion at a constant velocity unless a non-zero resultant force acts on it a body will remain in a state of rest or motion at constant velocity unless a non-zero resultant force acts on it and then 3.3 says uh, calculate the magnitude of the horizontal component of the applied force so on the applied force we have the vertical component that uh, points up right along the y-axis and then we have 
the horizontal component uh, that goes along the x-axis, right? If we wanna calculate uh, the vertical component, we see the force multiplied by sine of the angle. And then if we wanna determine the horizontal component, we'd see the force multiplied by cos of the angle. And then if we apply that same idea here, we're gonna get f of x, being the horizontal right is equals to the force multiplied by cos of theta what is the force the force is given as 90 newtons and then the angle is given as 50 degrees and then if you multiply 90 by cos of 50 you get 57.5 85 newton we can move to 3.4 3.4 says calculate the magnitude of the normal force a lot of people think that it's very easy to calculate the normal force but they usually get it wrong so this is what's going on here i want you to see something so we have this 19 newton force right if we resolve it about uh, the y-axis and we get the vertical component it will be pointing up like this right and we know fully well that uh, gravity is acting on this object so that's there is gravity pointing down but that's not only the only forces acting on the y-axis the other force that is acting on the y-axis is the normal force right which we are interested in so we know that uh, this box is moving at a constant velocity along the x-axis along the y-axis there is no movement so that tells us that um, the normal force plus the force applied perpendicular the y uh, component is equals to fg right because those two these three forces are balancing each other there's no movement along the y-axis these two forces here are equals to this force that's pulling it down so that's why there's no movement right so if you then want to calculate the normal force you will see normal force equals to fg minus fa perpendicular right so now you know that fg is the mass multiplied by 9.8 right you will get 45 multiplied by 9.8 minus 90 multiplied by sine of 50 degrees why are we saying sine of 50 degrees because we said that if we want to calculate the x component we use cos like we did here but then if we want the y component we use sine so if you punch that in your calculator it's gonna give you 372.06 newton and that will be your normal force and then 3.5 says calculate the coefficient of kinetic friction so let me erase these forces that i've put here and then i'll show you how we can solve this one so if we resolve the 19 newton force uh, along the x-axis it's gonna point in that way right it's gonna be pointing that way and then we know that friction opposes the motion so it's supposed to point in the opposite direction but then our equation says that the box move at constant velocity right what does constant velocity tells us it tells us that f net equals to ma but because it's constant velocity f net equals to zero what is f net f net is the addition of all forces that are acting on the object right so what are the forces acting on the object along the x-axis is f of x <coughs> fx right plus minus friction right because we put minus for friction because it's opposing the movement equals to zero what does this tell us this tell us that fx is equals to the friction right so in place of fx we can put 
what we calculated in 3.3 .3, which is 57.85 and then in place of friction we can put the coefficient multiplied by the normal force because we know fully well that friction is given by the coefficient multiplied by the normal force this will then be equals to 57.85 and then this will be equals to uh, the coefficient multiplied by the normal force which we completed in 3.4 right we see that it is 372.06 newton now we can divide both sides by 372.06 right and that will give us a coefficient of 0 0.16 and then what's the si unit of the coefficient the si unit of the coefficient is something we don't have because we have the force in newton and this normal force in newton so when you divide the si units cancel out and as a result we don't have an si unit for the coefficient of kinetic friction or static friction right and then 3.6 uh, says will the coefficient of kinetic friction change if the angle of the applied force is decreased right yes or no and give a reason no it's not gonna change because when we define kinetic frictional force we see that the force that opposes the motion of a moving object relative to a surface not relative to the applied force or anything else so if you want to change the coefficient of friction you change the surface and nothing else so no matter what else you change the coefficient will stay the same the coefficient only depends on the surface on the material and not anything else so that's the reason you would give learners are investigating a relationship between the mass of an object and the acceleration it experiences when a constant net force is applied on the object they use their results to draw the graph below and then there is the graph on the left hand side uh, we have one divided by acceleration on the y-axis and mass in kg on the x-axis and then 4.1 says state newton's second law of motion in words uh, we know fully well that it states that when a resultant force acts on an object the object will accelerate in the direction of the net force that acceleration is directly proportional to the net force and inversely proportional to the net force when a resultant force acts on an object the object will accelerate in the direction of the net force the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object and then 4.2 says calculate the gradient of the graph and then it says three marks this is just three free marks because you're not applying any physics you just calculate in the gradient so to calculate the gradient you're gonna pick any two points in our in the graph right and then calculate the gradient uh, between uh, the two points so let's say we put we pick the point uh, zero and zero here and then we pick this point here uh, which is zero point which is zero point two five and zero point five so we're gonna have um the gradient right m equals to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 even when you're calculating gradient in math you're never gonna be awarded three marks so let's go on let's carry on and uh, do what the question is asking of us so y2 uh, let's take 0 0.5 right so we're gonna say 0 0.5 minus y1 which is zero right minus zero divided by x2 uh, which is 0 0.25 so 0 0.25 uh, minus 0 and then this will be equals to 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.25 which is obviously just 2 
right so if you take any other points you're supposed to get the same thing let's say for instance you take uh this point here and this point when you calculate the gradient you will get the same exact thing so it's just three free marks and then let's do 4.3 4.3 says to us hence determine the net force applied on the object during the experiment right so for us to do that we first have to determine what does the gradient of this graph give us what does the gradient give us uh, because we can see that on the y-axis we have one divided by a and then on the x-axis we have the mass so we use f net equals to ma to try and make sense of the gradient of the graph so if we say f net uh, equals to ma uh, this f net will be our y right but we don't want f net to be our y we want a to be our y because uh, on our y we have one divided by a right so in order to achieve that we're gonna divide uh, by m and then we're gonna divide by m so as a result we'll get a equals to f net divided by uh, the mass but on our y-axis we have one divided by a clearly right and then here we have a so to do that we can take every side to the power of negative one right so if we say a uh, to the negative one equals to f net divided by m to the negative one we're gonna get one divided by a equals to m divided by f net right so we can also write this as 1 divided by a equals to 1 divided by f net multiplied by m we know fully well that in math uh, this can be y equals to mx plus c clearly our y is 1 divided by a our m is 1 divided by m net and then our x is the mass and then we don't have a c right our c is zero so we're gonna say the gradient is equal to one divided by f net but what is the gradient we know fully well that the gradient is two because we just calculated it so if we cross multiply we get f net uh, multiplied by two equals to one so f net equals to one divided by two newtons right so in order to answer these kind of questions you have to be able to play around with the formula and get what you want to get from it right in our case our point was to get uh, one divided by a as our y and then uh, we did exactly that so in another case that this might not be true we might not be given one divided by a as our y maybe we might be given m as our y or something else i don't know but you have to be comfortable with playing around with the formula so that you can get what you want and then 4.4 says write down a conclusion for this experiment okay so the conclusion of this experiment look at this so we know that f net equals to ma right and then if we make a the subject of the formula we get uh, f net divided by m right so here we can see that acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass if you can say that it would still be true because that is true and you can uh, deduce it from the graph but then if you use one divided by a you can see that as the mass increases one divided by, by a increases you, you can so you can also say that one divided by a is directly proportional to the mass of an object one divided by a is directly proportional to the mass of an object i hope that makes sense but if it doesn't leave a comment and i will reply accordingly we have a crate of mass 25 kg sliding down on a plane which is inclined at 15 degrees to the horizontal during the first part of the motion from a to b there is no friction between the crate and the plane but part bc has a rough surface and is denoted there by some dotted lines and then 
5.1 says draw a free body diagram of all the four six acting on the crate while it moves from B to C. So from B to C is the part that has uh, the friction, right? So if I draw the object there uh, somewhere in uh, BC, obviously we're gonna have the normal force acting perpendicular to the surface, right? Because that's how the normal force acts perpendicular to a surface. And then we have FG pointing down because as long as we are on a body there's always going to be fg whether we are on earth uh, whether we are on mars like in question six of this question paper there's always going to be fg and then another force that is acting is friction right uh, like we are told friction opposes the direction of the motion uh, thus as a result um is pointing towards point a right because that's where the object is coming from so if we draw a free body diagram of all those forces we're gonna have our free body there and then the normal force um the fg uh, force due to the gravity right and then we're gonna have our frictional force and with that we're gonna get our three marks and now we can move to 5.2 5.2 says calculate the magnitude of the acceleration of the crate while it moves from a to b so the best way of solving this kind of problems you have to draw a free body diagram first so that you can have a good understanding a good idea of what's going on so if we draw a free body diagram um while it moves from a to b we know that we have a normal force because it's resting on a surface right and then we have fg like we always do but then in this case we don't have gravity because from point a to <laughs> But in this case, we don't have friction because from point A to point B, the surface is said to be frictional less. So, yeah, that's a good point to start. Now, what we're going to say is that F net equals to ma and all the time when you're solving this kind of problems where you're supposed to count the acceleration the tension and all those kind of things you're always gonna start by f net equals to ma it's the same thing you're gonna do even when you're in grade 12 f net equals to ma and then in place of f net You put uh, the biggest force uh, that is acting on the body, right? And subtract all the small forces that are opposing the motion. But as you can see on this body of ours, we only have one force acting on the acting horizontally, uh, which is FG parallel, right? Because for FG, we're gonna have FG parallel and fg perpendicular so in place of f net we're just gonna say fg parallel if we had friction then we're gonna say minus friction and maybe if we had another box um connected to that box we're also gonna have minus tension but for this case we just have fg parallel so we're gonna say that this fg parallel is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration and then in place of fg parallel we can put uh, the mass right which is uh, 25 kg multiplied by 9,8 multiplied by sine of 15 degrees because this is this here is fg uh, 25 multiplied by 9,8 is FG, right? If the mass multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. And this part here, it gives us uh, the parallel component of FG, right? If we were interested on the perpendicular component, we, we, we were going to use cos. But then in this case, we are only interested on the parallel. So we are using sine.
So this will be equals to, we know the mass of the object fully well, that is 25 kgs, right? So this will be equals to 25 and then multiply by the acceleration. What's the acceleration? It's what we are interested in, right? So now we're just solving for A. We are done with the physics, basically. We just have a math problem. So we're going to have uh, the acceleration, which is equals to uh, 25 multiplied by 9,8, um, multiplied by sine of 15 degrees, uh, divided by 25. And then if you put that in your calculator, you're going to get A equals to 2.54 meters per second squared, right? And then you get your four marks. And now for 5.3, it says, write down the direction of the acceleration of the crate while it slows down from B to C. Uh, the key phrase here is slows down, while it slows down, right, from B to C, right, only up the slope or down the slope. So think about it. If an object is slowing down, it has a negative acceleration or is decelerating which is uh, a term we don't really use in physics uh, but then if a object uh, velocity is increasing or its speed is increasing then is acceler the acceleration of the body is positive right here we are told that it is slowing down so its velocity or its speed uh, is decreasing right it can only decrease if the acceleration is negative and then as the object is moving down the slope, it only makes sense that if uh, the acceleration is negative, it is up the slope, right? So the acceleration of this body is up the slope. And then uh, for 5.4, it says um, we must... Uh, the magnitude of the net acceleration from B to C is 1.2 meters per second, right? Uh, per second squared. And then it says calculate the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the crate. So again, we know that the mass of the object is uh, 25 kg, right? And that uh, the acceleration is 1.2 meters per second squared. That's what they're telling us. And now we're supposed to calculate the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the crate. Do you have any idea how we're supposed to solve this? Yes, the idea you have is right. Again, we're gonna say F net equals to ma it's very rare that you're gonna solve these kind of problems and not use f net equals to ma like you're always gonna use this uh, formula because now we know that uh from b to c there is frictional instead of just having fg parallel equals to ma like we did this time we're gonna have fg parallel plus minus uh, friction right because friction is always opposing the direction of the motion uh, this is obviously equals to ma this is our standard procedure if you find yourself doing anything else other than this you're doing something wrong so what is fg we know that fg is 25 multiplied by 9,8 and then the parallel component we're gonna multiply by sine of 15. Again, if we were looking for the uh, perpendicular component, we're going to multiply by cos of 15 degrees and then minus uh, friction, right? Which is what we are interested in. And this will be equals to the mass of the object, which is 25 kg, right? Multiply by an acceleration of 1.2 meters per second squared. And then, um, what you have to realize here is that we have to substitute at the acceleration with a negative sign, right? Of, so that will give us minus 1.2. Why are we <laughs> substituting it with a negative sign? Because in 5.3, we said that since the object is slowing down, the acceleration, it's 
up the slope so it's opposite to our direction of motion right if it's opposite to our direction of motion we put a negative sign just like we did with our friction so we're gonna have minus friction is equals to 25 multiplied by minus uh 1.2 right and then we're gonna subtract uh this whole expression here right so if we do that uh we're gonna get minus um 25 multiplied by 9,8 uh multiplied by sine of 15. so minus uh friction will be equals to uh minus 93.41 newton uh just to write it logically we will see this is uh friction uh, being equals to 93.41 newton every body in the universe attracts every other body with a gravitational force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance uh, between their centers so essentially we're saying that uh, f is equals to g m1 m2 uh, divided by r squared right so if you write it like this it becomes clear to see that every other body in the universe uh, will attract every other body uh, with a force that is directly proportional to the product of the body's masses and inversely proportional to the square distance between their centers and then uh, 6.2 is saying let's calculate uh, the mass of the probe the gravitational force on a probe called curiosity on the surface of mass is uh, 3338 newtons uh, so we have f being equal to 3338 uh, newtons and then it goes on to say that the radius of mass is 3390 kilometers so we have r have been equal to 3000 uh 390 uh, kilometers and then it goes on to say that uh, the mass of the planet is 6.39 times 10 to the 23 kg so we have uh, the mass of mass uh, being equals to 6.39 times 10 uh, to the 23 as you can see here our radius is given in kilometers right and then we know fully well that in physics we deal with the meters and not kilometers right so we just multiply this by a thousand and we have our radius uh, in meters so which equation are we going to use to find uh, the mass of the probe right uh, we're going to use f is equals to g uh, m1 m2 divided by r squared right uh, why are we using this formula the variables that we have allow us to use this formula even 6.1 give us a hint that we're supposed to use uh, newton's law of universal uh, gravitation so what is f we've already established that f is uh, 3338 newtons and then what is g it's a constant right uh, the gravitational acceleration uh, that is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 multiplied by uh, the mass of mass uh, the mass of mass is 6.39 times 10 to the 23 multiplied by uh, the mass of the probe this is what uh, we are looking for and then we divide in by um, r squared and that is uh, 3390 kilometers right we multiply by a thousand so that we can convert it to meters and we square so now it's easy to see that the only variable we have here uh, is the mass of the probe right so we're going to cross multiply in order to determine that mass so we're going to have uh, 3338 uh, multiply by uh, 3390 multiply by a thousand being equals to uh, so here you know that is the same as if we divide by one right so we're going to have 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 multiply by 6.39 times 10 to the 23 m right so now it should be easy to see that we're going to divide both sides uh, by the coefficient of m 
and then we would have determined our mass so if we do that we're going to get uh, the mass uh, being equals to 3338 multiplied by 3390 multiplied by a thousand and then now we divide in everything by the coefficient of m which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 multiplied by 6.39 times 10 to the 23 right and then if you put that in your calculator uh, you should get a mass of the probe which is equals to 900 kgs right and then now we can do 6.3 so for 6.3 here uh we're looking for the weight of the probe on earth right so we're looking for the weight and we know fully well that uh when we're looking for the weight we say that the weight is equals to the mass uh multiplied by the acceleration on that body of interest right so we know the mass of the uh, probe from 6.2 right it's 9000 and we know fully well the gravitational acceleration on the earth that is 9.8 uh so what are we saying here we're going to have uh, 900 have uh, been the mass, the gravitational acceleration, that is 9.8, right? And then if you put that in your calculator, uh, you should get 8,820 newtons. So which phenomenon is described by the underlying words, right? Uh, the light ray changes direction every time it passes into a new medium the light ray changes direction every time it passes into a new medium uh, we know fully well that is a refraction a light ray changes direction every time it passes through a new medium and then 7.2 says if the refractive index of water and air is 1.33 and 1 respectively so what does uh, respectively mean for water the refractive index is 1.33 and then for air the refractive index is 1 so let's denote that in our sketch right uh, for air the refractive index is 1 and then for water it's 1.33 uh, calculate the angle theta between the light ray and the surface of the water so we want the angle between the light ray and the surface of the water if the angle of refraction in the water is 40 degrees the angle of refraction is 40 degrees so fine um, let's write our information down right so an incident where is our light ray incident? It's incident on the air, right? And then the refractive index is 1. And then N refracted, the medium, uh, the light ray is moving into. Uh, we know that that is water, right? And the refractive index is 1.33. And then we are given uh, the refracted angle. So theta R for refracted, uh, which is said to be. 40 degrees and then the question is saying let's find uh, the angle of incidence of the ray right so that's what we looking for it should be easy to see that uh, we're going to use uh, Snell's law right uh, which says that uh, ni sine theta of i is equals to uh, nr and sine theta of r you can use n1 sine 1 is equals to n2 sine 2 uh, whatever you're comfortable with right uh, so what is the refractive index of the first medium uh, that is one right we're coming from a and then what is the angle that's exactly what we're looking for and then the refractive index of the medium we're moving into uh, that is water the refractive index is 1.33 and then sine of theta right uh, we're given the angle of the refractive ray relative to the normal it is said to be uh, 40 degrees so now uh, we can divide both sides by one right when you divide both sides by one we're still gonna get uh, whatever we have so now we can basically say that theta or the angle of incidence will be equals to sine arc of 1.33 multiply by sine of 40 degrees and then if you put that in your calculator uh, you're gonna get 58 
point seven five degrees. Uh, so what are we saying? What are we saying? Let's come to our sketch, right? Uh, this is the normal. We're saying that uh, this angle here is fifty eight point seven five, right? And then if we keep our normal going, uh, this angle here we are told that it is. 40 degrees let's use 7.3 uh, 7.3 saying that uh, the angle of refraction in the glass is 35 degrees calculate the refractive index of glass uh, so again uh, physics 101 right uh, we start by writing down the given information so this angle of refraction from air to water will be the angle of incidence from water to glass right so now we know that the angle of incident is equals to 40 degrees and then we are given the angle of refraction right so the angle of refraction is equals to uh, 35 degrees uh, what else do we know we know the refractive index of water right uh, we know that ni is equals to 1.33 what we're looking for is nr which is uh, our x right so again if you apply snell's law we're gonna get ni uh, sine theta of i is equals to nr sine theta of r so what is ni uh, we're coming from water right so it's 1.33 and then the angle uh, is the angle of refraction from air to water right uh, that is sine of 40 degrees uh, that will be equals to nr which is what we're looking for and then the angle of refraction uh, from water to glass is given to us as uh, 35 degrees right so now we're gonna say uh, 1.33 uh, multiplied by sine of uh, 40 degrees uh, divided by uh, sine of 35 degrees is equals to nr multiplied by sine of 35 degrees divided by sine of 35 degrees uh, we solve in for nr right and then if you put this in your calculator you're gonna get 1.49 is equals to and r right so the refractive index of glass is 1.49 and then it makes total sense we would like to think that the refractive index of water is greater than that of air and the refractive index of glass is greater than that of water right let's move to 7.4 so 7.4 is saying uh, draw the sketch below and complete the diagram of the path of the light ray from the air to the water to the glass show all the values of the angles of incidence angles of refraction and the normal in each medium so let's just uh, do that real quick right so we calculated the angle of incidence on the air, right? Uh, the angle of incidence on the air is not this theta here, right? We calculate the angle of incidence relative to the normal that I'm just constructing right now, right? Uh, we see that that angle is 58.75 degrees, right? And then uh, that ray, it gets refracted when we move from air to water, right? and there goes our ray right now we can construct our angle of refraction right uh, the angle of refraction uh, it is given to us as 40 degrees but then this angle of refraction from air to water will be our angle of incidence from water to glass right so if we construct a normal here uh, we should have an angle of 40 degrees uh, from water to glass and then again when we move from water to glass the ray will get refracted right the ray is getting refracted and then now let's construct our normal and place our angle right uh, the angle of refraction is between the ray and the normal and is given to us as 35 degrees if we're moving to a new medium then this angle of refraction will be the angle of incidence from the glass to the new medium um, now we can do 7.5 
uh, 7.5 is saying calculate the speed of light through the glass prism if the refractive index of glass is 1.5 we are given the refractive index of glass it is said to be 1.5 but we know fully well that the refractive index is equals to uh, the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium of interest right here we want the speed of light through the glass right so what is the refractive index we know that uh, that is 1.5 and then what is speed of light in vacuum 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second right divided by the speed of light in the medium so right now we cross multiplying and dividing both sides by 1.5 right we're gonna get the speed of light in uh, the glass prism being equals to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters uh, per second divided by 1.5 and then if you put that in your calculator you're gonna get 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second uh, 7.6 says that is it possible uh, that total internal reflection of the light ray can occur in the above situation right only yes or no right uh, so first thing first what is total internal reflection total internal reflection is when a light ray uh, gets inside a medium right and then it doesn't leave the medium uh, let me show you a demonstration so let's say um uh, this is our medium right and then we have a light ray coming in if this light ray comes in and the angle of refraction is either 90 degrees or greater than then the light ray won't leave that medium right if it's 90 degrees uh, then you can see that uh, the light ray stays in the medium and then if it is greater than 90 degrees then the light ray actually gets uh, reflected right and then you can see here in our diagram that uh, we don't have any angle of refraction which is 90 degrees or greater than right since we don't have that no total internal reflection will occur write down an investigative question uh, for this experiment so now we have to read the statement right uh, the statement says that an experiment is performed to investigate the effect of wavelength on the degree of diffraction right the experiment is performed to investigate the effect of wavelength on the degree of diffraction so what investigative question can you pose for this experiment right what is the relationship between wavelength of a light ray and degree of diffraction or another way you can say you can say how does a change in wavelength affect the degree of diffraction right uh, one between the two you can also change a few words but in the grand scheme of things we are looking for the relationship between the wavelength of a light ray and the degree of diffraction right and that is 8.2 now let's turn our attention to 8.3 so 8.3 is saying that the degree of diffraction is recorded for different colors of monochromatic light and the results are shown on the graph below on the y-axis we have the degree of diffraction and then on the x-axis we have the wavelength right and then the question is saying write the mathematical relationship between wavelength and the degree of diffraction the mathematical relationship between wavelength and the degree of diffraction we can see clearly from our graph right that the degree of diffraction is directly proportional to the wavelength right the degree of diffraction is directly proportional to the wavelength so what you write for 8.3 you say that uh, the degree of diffraction is directly proportional to the wavelength right as the wavelength increases the degree of diffraction also increases right 8.4 is saying which color of light between red and green has the largest degree of diffraction which color of light between red and green has the largest degree of diffraction 
up to so far we know that the degree of diffraction is directly proportional to the wavelength right uh, we have red and green so if we know uh, the wavelength is between red and green then we will know which one has the largest degree of diffraction so between red and green which color has the largest wavelength right now we have to go to our visible light spectrum right uh, we know that the trend goes like red orange yellow green blue indigo and violet and the wavelength increases as we move to the left so between red and green red has the largest wavelength right so it is going to have the greatest degree of diffraction so our answer for 8.4 is red right our answer here is red so if you are given different colors let's say uh, yellow and violet then which one will have the largest degree of a diffraction right we know fully well that yellow will have the largest degree of diffraction because it has a larger wavelength compared to violet uh, but what if you compare orange and blue right and then orange will have the highest degree of diffraction because it has a larger wavelength compared to blue that's how you approach the question right and then for 8.5 they say that the experiment is repeated with only green light with a wavelength of 516 nanometers but the slit width is changed and the degree of diffraction is recorded copy the set of axes below in your answer book and draw a graph showing the relationship between slit width and degree of diffraction so now uh, we need a relationship between degree of diffraction and slit width right uh, so the degree of diffraction we have already seen that is directly proportional to the wavelength right but not only is it directly proportional to the wavelength it is inversely proportional to the slit width right so when the slit width increases uh, the degree of diffraction decreases so here on our graph uh, we should have something of this manner you can see when the slit width is increasing the degree of diffraction is decreasing they're inversely proportional to each other columns law in words right uh, we know that f is equals to k q1 q2 divided by r squared so from this equation here we can see that uh, the electrostatic force that one point charge will exert on another will be directly proportional to the product of their charges and inversely proportional to the square distance between them so when you're in the exam and you don't remember the formula fully well you just write down the equation and it becomes fully clear right uh, the electrostatic force that one point charge will exert on another will be directly proportional to the product of their charges and inversely proportional to the square distance between them obviously uh, when you substitute the charges you don't put the size right uh, you just put the magnitude and now we can do 9.2 9.2 is saying let's draw a vector diagram of the forces acting on sphere a indicate at least one angle so let's look at sphere a right so sphere a uh, is hanging from a string of uh, negligible mass right and then it's interacting with sphere b so our sphere a here is positive right here's the charge and then sphere b is negative Yes, the charge right minus 8 times 10 to the minus 9 columns so how does a positive charge interact with a negative charge uh, they attract each other right so sphere b will be pulling sphere a to the left and then sphere a will be pulling sphere b uh, to the right so if we draw in a vector diagram of the forces acting on sphere a uh, then we should have a vector that shows uh, the electrostatic force that sphere b exerts on sphere a right and then apart from that there's a gravitational force acting on sphere a right so we should have another vector pointing downwards uh, which we can name weight or fg 
right and then last but not least we have the tension force from the steering acting at an angle right so the tension force is stopping sphere a from falling down because of gravity and then it's stopping sphere a from moving to the left right so this tension should be should look like this right and then there we have our tension force and then they say we should include at least one angle so you can just include the angle that is already there which is 20 degrees or you can put an angle here which is 70 degrees right and then now we have a vector diagram for sphere a and we can go ahead and do 9.3 so 9.3 says that uh, let's calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force that sphere b exerts on sphere a right so again we're seeing that uh, the electrostatic force is equals to k uh, q1 q2 divided by r squared right so we have the charges of q1 let's say q1 is uh, sphere a right so we know the charge of sphere a we know the charges the second sphere charge b right and then we know k that's a constant right and then now let's look for r squared the distance between them is given as three centimeters so we're gonna say that uh, r is equals to three centimeters uh, divided by a hundred uh, we're converting it to meters right uh, from centimeters to meters you divide by 100 so now we can say that the electrostatic force will be equals to so what is k we know fully well that k is 9 times 10 to the power 9 and then the charge on q1 right we are only interested on the magnitude we don't put the sign right uh, so we're gonna have 7 times 10 to the minus 9 and then q2 which is sphere b we're going to have 8 times 10 to the minus 9 we only put uh, the magnitude and not uh, the charge divided by r squared right uh, r we see that is 3 centimeters you convert it to meters by dividing by a hundred and then you square if you punch that uh, in your calculator uh, you should get 5.6 times 10 uh, to the what to the minus 4 uh, newtons and that's the magnitude of the electrostatic force that sphere b exerts on a it's also the magnitude of the electrostatic force that a exerts on b right uh, now let's do 9.4 9.4 says let's calculate the magnitude of the tension force in the string right so there's two ways of approaching this question uh, the magnitude of the tension force on the string right so again our vector diagram for a right uh, we had fe the electrostatic and then we had fg and then we had the tension at an angle right uh, we have already deduced that uh, this angle here is 70 degrees. Why are we saying it's 70 degrees? The angle here is 20. The angle here is 90. So that angle here should be 70 degrees. So because uh, the sphere A is not going up or down, right? Uh, the Y component of the tension force should be balancing with fg right but then still at the same time the sphere a is not going to the left or to the right so the x component of the tension force right should be balancing with the electrostatic force so if you equate these two you should be able to get the tension force and then if you also equate these two you should be able to get the tension force because they are balanced right uh, but then let's do both let's do both so let's equate uh, the y component of the tension and fg right so we have ty uh, being equals to fg so what is the tension force we don't know what the tension force is but then how do we find the y component we multiply by sine of theta we know that theta is 70 degrees right so we're gonna have multiply by sine of 70 degrees being equals to fg fg is the mass multiplied by uh, the gravity right if you look at our equation here we're told that the sphere has a mass of 0 0.2 grams right so we're going to have 0 0.2 divided by a thousand 
why are we dividing by thousand? The SI unit of mass in physics is kgs, right? So we have to divide grams to thousand to convert to kg. Multiply by 9.8. So now we can say that the tension is equals to 0 0.2 divided by a thousand multiplied by 9.8 and then everything divided by sine of 70 degrees. Uh, we just simply divide in both sides by 70 degrees, right? And the tension uh, should be equals to 2.08 five seven uh times ten to the minus three newtons right so we've used the first way to calculate it uh let's use the other so the other way we say that uh the x component of the tension will be equals to uh the electrostatic force right so now we're gonna have the tension multiplied by if you want to find the x component you take cos of the angle so we have cos 70 being equals to uh, the electrostatic force uh, we calculate the electrostatic force in 7 in 9.3 right uh, we know fully well that it is uh, 7.13 times 10 to the minus 4 right so now we divide in both sides by cos of 70 so the tension is going to be 7 point one three times ten to the minus four divided by cos of seventy and that is equals to two point uh zero eight uh four seven times ten to the minus three neutrons as you can see here we have two points uh p and t uh that are situated three millimeters apart in the electric field of positive charge q as shown below yeah it's easy to see and then for 10.1 uh, the question says that let's draw the electric field pattern around charge q clearly charge q is positive so the electric field lines should be radiating outwards right so in your answer book uh, we shall see uh, something of this manner and then if it was the other way around and the charge q uh, was negative uh, then the electric field lines uh, should be pointing uh, towards the charge itself and not outside uh, your electric field lines should be evenly separated and they should be of equal length right and then let's do 10.2 so we are told now that the magnitude of electric field at point p is 4 times 10 to the power 6 newtons per coulomb so for the sake of clarity let's just you know write that down before we solve any problems so we're seeing that the electric field at p right so we're calling that ep is equals to 4 times 10 to the 6 newtons per columns right and then at point t the magnitude is 2.5 times 10 to the 5 newtons per column so again for the sake of clarity let's say et right is equals to 2.5 uh, times 10 to the power 5 uh, newtons per column and then 10 point uh, 2.1 says uh, let's calculate the ratio of the electric field at point p to the electric field at point t write the answer as ep is to et so let me make an example here let's say uh, we had x is equals to 6 and y is equals to uh, let's say y is equals to 3 right and we say in that uh, let's find the ratio x is to y the ratio x is to y uh you would do the following so you would say x is to y in place of x you put in six and then in place of y you put in three right but then you can see that you can divide both sides by three and then if you do that uh you're gonna get uh two is to one and that's the ratio of x to y so we are applying the same idea here right we're saying that ep is to et but then what is ep we know fully well that ep is 4 uh, times 10 to the 6 uh, newtons per column and then what is et that is 2.5 times 10 to the 5 newtons per column 
right? So we are dividing which number by which number here because it's no longer straightforward. Uh, like for instance, when you have six and three, right? So we divide uh, both number by the smallest. Clearly, between four times ten to the six and two point five times ten to the five. 2.5 times 10 to the 5 is the smallest one. So we're going to divide by 2.5 times 10 to the 5 on both sides. Uh, so on the right hand side, we essentially uh, dividing it by itself. So we should get 1, right? And then now we're going to see 4 times 10 to the 6 divided by 2.5 times 10 to the 5, right? That should give you 16. So EP is to ET as a ratio of 16 is to 1. And now let's do 10.2.2. 10.2.2 10 .2 is a bit complicated. Uh, there's some math here that is involved, right? Uh, but let's see uh, what we can do. So he's saying let's find the distance between charge Q and point P, charge Q and point P, right? So let's see uh, what we can do here. So obviously we can say EP is equals to K Q divided by R squared, right? That's the formula we have for uh, the strength of an electric field at a given point, right? But then lucky for us, we know fully well what EP is. EP is four times 10, to the power of 6, which is equals to k. Uh, k is a constant that is 9 times 10 to the power 9. And then q, at this point, we don't know the value of q, right? So we'll just uh, put it as it is. And then from q to p, we don't know the distance. That's what we're looking for. So let's just put r squared, right? And then, yeah, you should be able to see now that we stuck. We have two variables and one equation, so we need another equation. How can we find another equation? We can we can use point t. Uh, so let me show you what I'm talking about, right? Uh, so here, uh, just to finish this off, uh, let's cross multiply. If we cross multiply, uh, we're gonna get uh, four times ten to the six multiplied by r squared is equals to nine times 10 to the nine multiplied by Q. And then we can call this our equation one, right? And now uh, to use point T, we're gonna say that uh, ET is equals to K Q divided by R squared. And then what is ET? We know fully well what ET is again, right? Uh, that is 2.5 times 10 to the five uh, being equals to nine times 10 to the 9 and then uh, what is Q? Uh, we still don't know what Q is and then now uh, what is R squared? No, now R squared is the distance from Q to T, right? We already established that the distance from Q to P is R, right? So Q T should be R plus these 3 millimeters here, right? It's only fair. So we're gonna have uh, R plus three millimeters, right? Uh, we don't deal uh, with millimeters in physics, we deal with meters. So we have to divide that by a thousand. So we're gonna have three divided by a thousand um, squared, right? Uh, now you can see that you have two variables. We're gonna end up with two equations um, and then we're gonna find R, right? Uh, therefore, so if we cross multiply here, uh, we shall get uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 5 uh, multiplied by r plus 3 divided by a thousand squared uh, being equals to 9 times 10 to the power of 9 multiplied by q and then what are we calling this one we're calling this one equation 2 so you can see that uh, 9 times 10 to the 9 multiplied by q is equal to uh, this expression here but then at the same time, 9 times 10 to the power of 9 multiplied by Q is equal to uh, this expression here. So we can equate the two expressions. Uh, we're only going to have R as our variable and we're going to try and solve that. So if we do that, uh, we can say that uh, equation 1 is equal to equation 2, obviously, because they're all equals to 9 times 10 to the 9 multiplied by Q. So uh, equation 1 there was... Four times ten 
uh, to the 6 multiplied by uh, r squared. Yes. And then our equation 2, we have uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 5 multiplied by r plus 3 divided by uh, 1,000 squared, right? So a lot of people, when they get to this step, uh, they're going to uh, solve this square here, right? Uh, but then if you do that, the problem becomes very complicated. So what I want you to do instead you take square roots on both sides so that you don't have to square anything and end up having to solve a quadratic uh, equation, right? Uh, so let me show you what I'm talking about. So we're going to take uh, the square root on uh, the left-hand side and we're also going to take uh, the square root on the right-hand side. If we do that, we're going to get uh, the square root of uh, 4 times 10 to the power of 6 multiply by instead of r squared now we just have r right and then on the right hand side uh, we're going to have the square root of 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5 and then instead this square here uh, that i'm circling right now uh, is going to fall off right because we're taking the square root so we're just going to have r plus uh, 3 divided by a thousand and then we don't have the square root anymore, right? So now uh, we're gonna multiply out uh, the right hand side. After we have multiply out the right hand side, we're just going to solve for r. Uh, so let me show you what I'm talking about. So we're gonna have um, the square root of four times 10 to the six multiplied by r uh, being equals to the square root of 2.5 times 10 to the five uh, multiplied by r plus uh, the square root of 2.5 times 10 uh, to the 5 multiplied by 3 divided by um, a thousand. Uh, so now uh, we have r here and then we have r here. We group in the like terms. So we're going to, going to have um, 4 times 10 uh, to the 6 r minus uh, the square root of 2.5 times 10 to the 5 uh, r uh, being equals to um, 2.5 times 10 to the 5 multiplied by 3 divided by a thousand so i'm actually not going to put this in the calculator right i'm just going to take r as a common factor so if i do that i'm going to get um 4 times 10 uh, to the 6 minus uh 2.5 times 10 to the 5 r is common factor and this should be equals to uh, the square root of 2.5 times 10 to the 5 multiplied by 3 divided by a thousand. I hope you're having as much fun watching this video as I'm having making it. So now I'm going to divide both sides by the coefficient of r, right? And then if I do that, I should get r is equals to uh, the square root of 2.5 times 10 to the 5 uh, multiplied by 3 divided by a thousand. Right, and then now we're dividing by that coefficient, uh, which is the square root of 4 times uh, 10 to the 6 uh, minus uh, the square root of 2.5 times 10 uh, to the 5. And then now you can finally put the, uh, this expression in your calculator in attempt to find uh, the final answer, right? And you should get um, 0 0.001 meters, right? Oh, that is also equals to one millimeter. So, um, the distance between Q and point P is one millimeter or 0 0.001 uh, meters. Uh, and finally, uh, to find the magnitude of charge Q, uh, the magnitude of charge Q, right? Uh, we can use the electric field, uh, at P or at T, right? It doesn't matter right now because we have R. It will be easy to find a Q, right? So let's just uh, use EP. So we have EP is equals to, uh, so we have KQ divided by R squared, right? Uh, but then EP is given to us. We know fully well that uh, that is four times 10 to the six uh, being equals to nine uh, times 10 to the nine uh, multiplied by Q. And then we divide in everything by 0 0.001 meters, right? Uh, 0 0.001 meters. 
and then uh, we shouldn't forget to square so now um, yeah we can cross multiply if you cross multiply you get 4 times 10 to the 6 multiply by 0 0.001 squared bin equals to uh, 9 times 10 to the 9 multiply by Q you divide both sides uh, by 9 times 10 to the 9 right so you should get Q is equals to 4.44 times 10 to the minus 10 columns how do we calculate the change in the magnetic flux so there's two ways of doing it right uh, one way you can say that uh, the change in the magnetic flux right uh, will be given as the magnetic flux final minus the magnetic flux initial right uh, that's one way of doing it another way of doing it you can use uh, the emf induced in the coil right uh, that will be the emf is equals to uh, minus n being the number of turns in the coil multiplied by the change in the magnetic flux divided by uh, the change in time so in the second formula if you have the change in time you have the number of terms and you have the emf induced then you just solve uh, for the change in the magnetic flux right so that's how you use uh, the second formula and then the first formula this is how you use it let's say maybe uh, we changed uh, the angle right then uh, there's going to be a change in the magnetic flux and consequently you'll be saying magnetic flux final minus magnetic flux initial uh, to find that change right so in this question uh, let's look at the information we have and see which one of these two options uh, we can go for so here we are told that uh, a square induction coil with a side of three centimeters so before we go any further we have a square induction coil with a side length of three centimeters right so now we know fully well that we have an area uh, of that square right uh, which we can calculate and then it goes on to say uh, the coil has 400 uh, windings right so 400 windings uh, that's just another name for 400 tens so we have n is equals to uh, 400 right and then uh, it goes on to say that uh, that coil is placed perpendicularly in a uniform magnetic field what does perpendicularly in a uniform magnetic field tells us it tells us that initially uh, the angle was equals to zero because if you place this because if you place it uh, perpendicularly in a magnetic field then the induced emf is at a maximum right so that angle should be equals to zero and then it's roto and then it's rotated until uh, we have an angle theta uh, which is equals to uh, 45 degrees so this will be our initial here and this here will be uh, our final and that rotation uh, it takes a time of um, 0 0.08 second right so to find the change in the magnetic flux here we're going to use the second formula right because uh, clearly we have uh, the time here uh, we have the number of tens and then let's see if we have uh, the EMF right because we need the EMF yeah the question here also tells us uh, that the EMF induced in the coil is 7 volts so we can go ahead and uh, use that formula so for 11.2 here we're going to say that uh, the EMF will be equals to minus n the number of tens on the coil right this is the formula we use multiply by the change in the magnetic flux divided by uh, the change in time so what is the emf uh, the emf is seven right and then what how many number of tens do we have on the coil we have 400 uh, tens on the coil and then we're looking for the change in the magnetic flux divided by uh, the change in time uh, the time is 0 0.08 seconds right so let me uh, put that in 0 0.08 seconds so you can see here that uh, we're going to cross multiply if we do that uh, we're going to get minus 400 multiplied by the change in the magnetic flux being equals to 7 multiplied by 0 0.08 so uh, the change in the magnetic flux will be equal to 7 multiplied by 0 0.08 divided by minus 400, right? Uh, so we're expecting a negative value there. And then if you put it in your calculator, it should get minus 1.4 
times 10 to the minus 3 uh, WB right uh, that's waiver and then uh, we are done with 11.2 now what we need to do for 11.3 is to find the magnitude of the magnetic field we want the magnitude of the magnetic field right so this is how we're going to do it uh, the symbol for the magnetic field is B right it's measured in Tesla right to find that magnetic field we're going to use the change in the magnetic flux let me show you how we said that uh, the first formula you can use uh, is this uh, one right here right and then uh, the second formula you can use is this one that involved EMF, which we just use, right? So we're going to use uh, the first formula to find Yeah, the magnitude of the magnetic field. So let me show you what we're talking about. So the change in the magnetic flux We've already established that uh, that is magnetic flux final minus magnetic flux initial but then what you have to ask yourself is that how do we calculate magnetic flux initial and how do we calculate magnetic flux final right uh, the formula for magnetic flux is equals to the magnetic field multiplied by the area and then cos of the angle right so the change in the magnetic flux will be equals to uh, so we have b multiplied by the area and then cos of theta final minus b magnetic field multiplied by the area cos of theta initial right uh this concept is a bit uh, confusing if you're doing it uh for the first few times so you might want to you know take the video back or go watch other videos uh that i've done on the topic uh but anyway uh stories in passing right uh what i want you to realize here is that we have the magnetic uh field and the area magnetic field and the area so we can pull that out as a common factor right uh, i'm not so sure i'm allowed to say pull that out but yeah let's see what happens so we have the change in the magnetic uh flux being equals to uh, the magnetic field strength multiplied by the area and then multiplied by cos of uh, theta final minus cos of uh, theta initial in place of the change in the magnetic uh, flux we go to have minus 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, that's what we just calculated in 11.2 right uh, that will be equals to the strength of the magnetic field what we are looking for and then the area the area we given the length of the side is three centimeters we have a square so length times breadth will just be side multiplied by side right but then the problem here the length is given in centimeters and we know fully well that in physics we are dealing with meters right so we have to convert that to meters uh, by dividing by a hundred right and then multiply by three divided by a hundred and then cos of theta final right so the final angle was 45 degrees so we're gonna have um, cos of 45 minus cos of zero right and then now you can see that the only variable we have is the strength of the magnetic field right so the physics is done we're just solving the math now right uh, and then how are we going to do that we're going to divide both sides by the coefficient of the magnetic field let me show you what i'm talking about so this will give us uh b which is the strength of the magnetic field uh, being equals to minus 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, divided by uh, that coefficient there of the magnetic field right uh, which is uh, 3 divided by 100 multiplied by 3 divided by 100 and then we have cos of 45 minus uh, cos of zero right and then uh, it turns out that uh, if you put that in your calculator you should get 5.31 uh, t right tesla that's the si unit of magnetic field now let's do 11.4 the interesting equations the coil is now rotated through an angle of 45 degrees in a time of uh, 0 0.05 second don't forget don't forget don't forget initially uh, we had rotated through an angle of 45 degrees 
at a time of 0 0.08 second right so from 0 0.08 second to 0 0.05 second so now we're rotating it faster what is the consequence of that as far as the induced emf is concerned right let's go to the formula the emf is equal to minus n the number of turns on the coil multiplied by the change in the magnetic flux right and then we divide that uh, by time so if you look at this equation you shall see that uh, the emf induced is inversely proportional to the time taken right so if you increase the time you reduce the emf if you reduce the time you increase the emf clearly here we're going from 0 0.08 to 0 0.05 so we're reducing the time if we reduce the time the induced emf should increase no questions asked right and then uh, 11.5 says explain your answer to 11.4 uh, we've done that uh, but you can just say that uh, the emf is inversely proportional uh, to the time taken right so if the time increases the emf should go down but in our case the time is decreasing so let's say uh, delta t uh, decreases if delta t decreases and then uh, emf uh, should increase right and yeah that's all we're saying essentially uh let's do uh, 11.6 so 11.6 says the north pole of a bar magnet is put into a solenoid as shown in the sketch below right uh, clearly we have um, our bar magnet here and then uh, we're given the north pole and if the north pole is on that end and the south pole is in this end no questions asked right and then now the question is saying that uh, which pole will be induced at x right only north or south so this is the trick if you have a bar magnet and you are either pushing it into uh, the coil or outside of the coin right where you're pushing it in or where you're pulling it out right a pole that opposes the interaction will be induced what am i saying let me show you what i'm saying so let's say uh we're pushing it uh towards right so let's say uh we're pushing it towards right and then here we have the north and then here we have the south and then here we have and the coil right if we're pushing it towards uh the pole that will be induced here is the pole that uh, opposes the motion so because you're pushing it towards a pole that pushes it away will be induced right so if we're pushing it towards and then we have the north pole then here the north pole is going to be induced so that it can push it um away right so let's say uh we were pushing it uh, away right so if we we're pushing uh, the magnet away then a south pole would be in use because it's opposing the interaction right you're taking the magnet away then a south pole will be induced so that it can pull it towards so whatever you do with the magnet a pole that opposes the interaction will be in use so here like we've said uh we're pushing it uh towards right so a north pole will be induced so that it can oppose that interaction and then for 11.7 it says that in which direction will the induced current flow right only uh, from a to b or from b to a so if we have north on that end we should have south to that end right uh, this is positive this is negative uh, the conventional flow of current is from positive to negative right so it will be flowing from a uh, to b 12.1 says calculate the value of resistor r if the total resistance of the circuit is 4.8 ohms so we know uh, that r total is equals to the resistance in series plus the resistance in parallel so let's start with the resistance in series when do we say that a resistor is in series we say that a resistor is in series only if it gets undivided current if it gets i total it is in series right so 
from our circuit here we have the positive terminal and the negative terminal right and the current flows from the positive to the negative but then it cannot uh, bypass like this it has to take the long route so the current is going to take this path it goes down this way uh, this way and then still going down and then at this point it splits right some proportion of the current uh, will go in this direction and another proportion of the current uh, will go down uh, in this direction right so let's just call this current uh, i y that is here and then let's call the current that is here uh, i x i x and i x and then at some point here i x and i y meet and then we have i total again here we also have i total so clearly there's no resistance that's gonna get i total so for this circuit of ours uh the resistance in total uh will be equals to zero plus the resistance in parallel uh, so we're gonna have rt uh, being equals to rp so now we can look for uh the resistance in parallel and calculate uh, that resistance as a consequence right so let me just erase some of this stuff i've put in here and let's see how we can you know solve this problem so we have already established that at this point uh the current splits right and then a proportion comes to this side so this resistor here is getting a current ix and then uh going down we have a proportion of uh the current right uh going in this direction so these three resistors uh they get the same current iy right because after this split here the current is not splitting anywhere else so the 3r resistor and the 2r resistor and the r resistor will get the same current so these three here are getting the same current so these three resistors are in series but not say in series relative to the circuit but relative to each other so the resistance in this line here uh, will be uh, resistance equals to 3r plus 2r plus r right and then the resistance on the line on the top will just be r equals to 4r so this resistance here is in parallel with this resistance here and that's the resistance uh, we have to calculate so if we do that we're gonna get uh, rt equals to r1 multiplied by r2 divided by r1 plus r2 so what is rt rt is 4.8 and then r1 uh, is this resistance here right which is 4r and then we multiply it by uh, 3r plus 2r plus r that will be 6r right so we have 6r divided by 4r plus 6r so that will just be 10r so now we have 4.8 uh being equals to uh 24 uh 24 r squared divided by 10 r so r and r cancel out so we're only left with one area so we're gonna have uh 4.8 equals to 24 r uh, divided by 10. so if you solve this you get r uh, equals to 10 multiplied by 4.8 divided by 24 and then if you punch that in your calculator you're gonna get r being equals to 2 ohms and you have essentially solved your problem and then now for 12.2 it says uh calculate the reading on the voltmeter if the current through the 4r resistor is 1.8 ohm so fine let me just erase this so that we can have uh, some clarity so today so we know that the current here uh i is equals to uh 1.8 uh amps right and then uh we're supposed to calculate the reading on this voltmeter here so what do we know about uh resistors in parallel we know that there is for the resistors in parallel uh the voltage is the same right so if we calculate uh the voltage of this line it will be equal to the voltage uh in this line too right so let's go ahead and do that so we're gonna have uh v uh on the 4r resistor is equal to i 
multiply by uh, the resistance of 4R. So that will be equals to 1.8 uh, multiplied by 4 multiply by 2 because uh, this resistor is 4R, right? And we know fully well that R is equals to 2. So if you say 1.8 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 2, uh, that will give you 14.4 uh, volts. So we know that uh, the voltage uh, on the line at the top uh, this line here is 14.4 uh, volts, right? But because it's parallel to this line, then the voltage on this line will also be 14.4 because we know that for resistors in parallel, the voltage is the same, but the current is different. So, okay, fine. We have um, the voltage of the line on the bottom, right? Which is 14.4 volts. And then uh, we don't have the current, right? But we have the resistance because the resistance is 6R and R is equal to 2. So the resistance is essentially uh, 12 ohms, right? So from this, we can then calculate the current on this line. If we calculate the current on this line, then it will be easy to determine the reading of the voltmeter. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to have V equals to I multiplied by R. So 14.4 equals to I multiply by 12 so we have i being equals to 14.4 uh, divided by 12 so let me just 14.4 divided by 12 uh, that is equals to 1.2 uh, ohms right so 3r 2r and r are in series to each other so their current is the same right so the current being experienced by this 2r resistor is also 1.2 ohms so we can see uh, the reading on the voltmeter right uh, will be equal to i um, i multiplied by r what is i i is 1.2 and then what is r is 2 multiplied by 2 so 1.2 multiplied by um multiply by two multiply by another two uh that is four point eight volts so the uh the reading on voltmeter on the voltmeter will be four point eight volts uh now let's move ahead and do uh twelve point three twelve point three says concrete the energy converted uh in resistor 4r in two minutes uh we know here that the energy the formula of the energy is given by uh w is equals to uh the power multiplied by the change in time but the power can be equals to two things right uh the power will be equals to v squared divided by r or i squared uh, multiply by R. So let's uh, go ahead and look at uh, the information we have for the 4R resistor so that we can decide which formula to use. So if we go to 4R then uh, you will realize that we know the current. Uh, it is said to be 1.8 uh, amps, right? So we're gonna use uh, this formula of P. And then it says in two minutes. So we know fully well in physics we deal with seconds. So we're gonna convert uh, that two minutes to seconds essentially. So now we're gonna have W uh, being equals to I squared uh, multiplied by R multiplied by the change in time. So what is I? I we said is 1.8. Uh, we square it. And then we multiply by 4, multiply by 2, because the value of R is 2. And then multiply by uh, the 2 minutes. And then we multiply the 2 minutes by 60 to convert to seconds, right? And if you punch that in your calculator, uh, you're going to get uh, the work uh, being equals to 1, 1, oh, 3, 6, point eight uh joules and then you are essentially done and then for 12.4 we are told that um the 4r resistor is re replaced with an ammeter right so here we no longer have a uh, 4r but we have uh, some ammeter a uh, here you have to know something you have to know something you have to know that the ammeter has a negligible 
resistant. So if you connect it in parallel, it's gonna short circuit your circuit, right? And then the question asks us, how will the reading on the voltmeter be influenced? Right, only increase, decrease, or stays the same. So let me show you what I mean when I say it will short circuit the circuit. So we have the current from the positive terminal, obviously, flowing, and then there goes our current, there goes our current, at this point, if you replace the 4R resistor with an ammeter, the current will not go down. It will take the path with the least resistance. So it's gonna go down in this way, go down in this way, and then go up. So all these resistors, uh, the 3R resistor, uh, the 2R resistor, and then the R resistor, they will be left with no current. So basically the reading on the voltmeter will be zero because you're gonna have V equals to I multiplied by R. I now is zero, so no matter what the resistance is, will just be equal to zero volts, right? So you're coming from, uh, I think it's four point, you're coming from 4.8 volts to zero volts. So obviously that's a decrease. That's a decrease. And then 12.5 uh, asks you to explain your answer in 12.4. And that's what I just explained. An ammeter has a negligible resistance. So if you connect it in parallel, it's gonna short circuit your circuit, right? So the other resistors won't get any current. Uh, consequently, the 2R resistor is not getting any current.